it's been an awesome service already. Thank you to the worship team for leading us and helping us to the worship in a great way. I want to say hi to everybody who's there at home watching us online. Yeah. You guys are here as well. And uh, for those of you who are figuring out how to give or whatever, there's some information on how to give by push pay uh, as you're leaving. But it's just good to be together. This is our uh, what, third week together, I believe. I'm not on. See if I'm on here. There I am. All right. Okay, we're on. Uh, it's our second or third week together here. It, third week. There we go. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, it, it's just refreshing to be here, to worship. I know we got to start planning a worship night. Even as we were singing, I was like, we need, to, we need a worship night here. I know this one's off. It might be one of these here. But anyway, it's a problem. Somebody can come up and take care of it for us. Uh, but it is great to be together. I know we're, you know, trying to follow the laws of the land at some level and be separate and be together. And, you know, this is a crazy time, right? We've never done church. We are outside for six or eight months. Uh, we have a few rows there that if people are comfortable and they're vaccinated for them to sit, really, we're not trying to exclude people. It's just so we can all fit. We're trying to get everybody to all fit. So if you're vaccinated and you're not comfortable, sit wherever you want. Uh, we just want to be together. We want to worship God, and it is just awesome to be together. And today the service is called A Saving Faith, and it's kind of a play on words with special missions because we've all been saving for this day, but it's also the, a saving faith is the only kind you could have if you're trying to get where we're all trying to go. And we're going to hear today a powerful lesson in the book of James who leaves no, he doesn't wear gloves when he goes for it. He just goes right after it. And we're going to find that out today. But th today's the, one of the, the, the main theme of the entire book is without, faith without deeds is dead. That's the, if you read the book of James, that's the main thing he's trying to get across. And uh, it, it is an inspiring book, but it's kind of a punch in the face at the same time. And it's going to help us to live by grace, but also to look at our lives and see what our faith is and what our deeds are. Amen. That knowing that if they don't go together, that's not a good thing. And we've learned in the book of James as we started that this is a book written to the Hebrew Christians when they were going through trials. They were getting persecuted. There was challenges. There was issues. The, the Gentiles just started coming into the church for the first time, so they had friction and issues, and that's why there's a lot in there about listening and watching your tongue and not getting angry with one another and all these kinds of good things that is good for all of us to pay attention to, right? And the theme that we talked about a couple weeks ago that applies today is when church ends church begins. That really, it's not all about what happens at church because we're all in our best behavior and everything's hunky in church. But it's more when you get out of church, that's what God is really looking at and really to not show favoritism and to show mercy and to be put the golden rule into practice in a great way. So I'm excited to look at some verses talking about a saving faith. Uh, pray with me as we get started. Uh, Father, it's just great to be together. It's been an awesome service so far. I pray that you really get me out of the way so that we can hear your words, God, that they can, they can hit our hearts, God. Help us not to be defensive and just be humble and listen to the word that is going out. God, in a special way, I pray for our sister in Riverside, Halima Todd, who passed away suddenly this week. And uh, we pray that she just uh, is entering into the gates, God. Even as we speak, she's probably already there. And uh, we do pray for Mikhail and his uh, family with the passing of his grandmother this week as well. I pray that you comfort all those families that are left behind, God, that you help everyone to be, draw near to you. And God, I pray that you inspire them and also inspire us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start reading in James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith 
but has no deeds. Can such a faith save them? Supposing a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Wow, what an introductory verse. I remember coming to a church like this for the first time and seeing people that really lived out their faith, not just when they were at church, but when they went outside. And when I ran into them during the week and when we went out to lunch, they wanted to know what I got out of the message and how God was speaking to me that day. And I had really never had a conversation about church. I just went to church and then I left church. And I got my good feelings while I was there, and I never really got too deep about it. But in so many ways, I, it hit me uh, after one service, it is about time that somebody told the truth at church. It's about time that somebody said, hey, you can't be a Christian and live the way you're living. And more specifically, it was me, the way I was living and the where I was up to. But here he's talking to them. He says, Can you, is your faith worth anything if you see someone in need and you do nothing? It's pretty obvious. What's the answer? No, it's not. He's like, is this a saving faith? He's like, no, it's not. It's a nice word. It's a good gesture, but it doesn't help the person that's in need. There's no love. Because the gospel is all about loving one another. He just got finished talking about loving others as you want to be loved. When there's a need, don't you want someone to meet it? If you're thirsty, wouldn't you like a drink? If you, if you don't have clothes or food or whatever. But in the same here, he's talking about their basic needs of keeping warm and having food, and that applies to many other things, right? Not just that, that's our basic needs, but it, maybe it's having a place to live. Maybe it's having respect. Maybe it's giving love, treating someone with respect and love and consideration and all the things that Christ did. Think about it another way. Imagine Jesus, if somebody came up to him who was hungry. That's what we're supposed to be doing. How would Jesus respond to this person coming up to him? I mean, look through the Gospels and see. I mean, he fed people, he healed people, he did all kinds of stuff. That wasn't his really his mission. But his heart was to love, and his heart was to respond to the physical needs of those around him. How many times have you and I said the words, God bless you, and not done anything? I'll pray for you, and sometimes we forget to pray for them. But when we're praying for them, we don't respond to the spirit that says, to go a little further. Or we wish someone good luck. Just think about Christ when you have that spirit. Because this was the law that brings freedom. I know it's getting quiet in here because we're, we've all done this, right? We, we've all missed needs. We've missed opportunities. We've been hypocrites. We've said one thing and we've done another. That's not the point. The point is not to be perfect. The point is to be honest and to have a heart that is moved by people around us. And that's where the freedom comes in. About time that somebody finally told us the truth. If we're not trying to live like Christ, then it's not a saving faith at all. And I found these pictures here. And the one says, help me stop doing this. And just having a heart. You know, I have a story to tell you. The other night after uh, church, uh, I was going to Ralph's, 
uh, one of the brothers had told me that there was a, a sale on ribeye steaks, right? <laughs> so we were praying all day. I was hungry. I was going after there. Man, I'm going to get me some ribeye steaks. I'm going to eat it. I don't care if it's 9.30 at night. I'm breaking all the dietary rules, but I'm going to get the biggest one I can find. And I'm not going to have any vegetables. I'm not going to have potatoes. It's just going to be just steak. I'm sorry for you vegetarians uh, out there. So I go in. I go through the whole meat market. I go through it twice. And there's not one ribeye in the whole place. They had one, but it was like those prepackaged ones with all the salt and the expiration date forever. And I'm just like, ah. That doesn't look real good. So I'm leaving. I'm depressed. I'm going out to my car. And I go by this uh, homeless man out there as I'm going to my car. And he asked me for a mask, you know, uh, a face mask. He's like, I need a face mask. And I'll just tell you what he said. He's like, I need a face mask. I need to go buy some cigarettes. So I'm going, man, this is my favorite face mask. <laughs> you know, I said, no. OK, I just kept walking to the car. I'm like, well, he's going to buy cigarettes anyway. They're not good for you. And so I get to the car, and I'm thinking about this sermon, right? And I'm like, you know what? What do I need a mask for? I got a 1,000 masks. He wants to have some cigarettes. Maybe it'll help him be less hungry or whatever. Went back, give him the mask. And it was just a small little thing. But it reminded me of this whole entire sermon of all the different thoughts I had towards this man and why he wanted cigarettes and what he was going to do with it and all the different things. And just thinking about, wow, I need to be like Christ. I don't care if you're doing cigarettes or whatever. Maybe that's what that guy needed for that night. But having a heart of, hey, even if I'm giving up my favorite mask, even if it's inconvenient to be moved by the Spirit that is around us. And sometimes we could be more moved by the dog on the other side of the screen. Right? This was a dog walking around on a hot day with a bull, just trying to get a drink. And shame on us that if you're a dog person, I'm a dog person, right? If I saw a dog that way, there is no way I would not figure out a way to get a drink for the dog. And yet, I can sometimes have more compassion on a dog with a bowl than I have on a person made in God's image. Wow. That when, G when Jesus said, when you see their face, you should see me. Yeah. And I pray that we can have that heart that in, underneath the outer extremities is what Christ created in this person. Next time you have that interaction, just ask the person what their name is. Ask them, how did you end up here? And they'll tell you. That's not judgmental. That's just they, they want to tell you. And just want to have someone to listen to their life. That's what Christ would do. Sometimes we're not really there, but those are the deeds of faith that God wants us to have. That's a small thing. I'm not patting myself on the back. That was nothing compared to Jesus. He says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Wow. I believe in Christ that's really great. So do the demons. Yeah. Not a, really a conversation starter in a party, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad you believe in Jesus. So do the demons. <laughs> but he was about putting their faith into practice, loving one another, providing for those in need, reaching out to fellow disciples and encouraging them. Every encouraging people to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, giving sacrificially, helping people know Christ that don't know him already, taking care of one another, 
in one another, putting one another's scriptures in practice like Ray was talking about at the very beginning of the service. Guess what, guys? He's not talking to the church. I mean, to the world, he's talking to the church. Right. Putting these things into practice in our lives. Are we doing this? Do we come to church? Do we even come to church? Do we watch it online if we're at home? When was the last time you got together with someone and opened up the Bible outside of church? When was the last time you shared your faith with someone that you didn't know? When was the last time you shared your faith with someone you did know? When was the last time you opened the Bible to help someone become a Christian? When was the last time you confessed your sin? When was the last time you asked a disciple for help in a situation that you didn't know what to do? When was the last time that you said Jesus is Lord and meant it? That's what he's saying to them. And that's what he's saying to us. We have let this world get in the way of our relationship with Christ. We've let all the craziness get in the way. We've let COVID get in the way. And I can say that I have done the same thing. And so I can take responsibility for that. I've led you there. And guess what? Now it's time to stop. <laughs> now it's time to say Jesus is Lord again and mean it and start doing the things that we know to do. Because that's what a saving faith does. Can you believe that as he was writing this and reading this, that there were people in Asia Minor that probably did not have a saving faith even though they thought they did. Isn't that what that means? There's probably people in this room that think, oh, I'm going to heaven, and he's like, well, I don't think so. The demons thing again. You know, this is out of love because he wants them to repent and to change. Let me put it in a, in a different way. Imagine parenting with no deeds. I love my kid. They're the apple of my eye. They're so incredible. And what comes with that? Late nights, early mornings, feedings, getting stuff all over you, having to change your clothes before you go to work because they threw up on you. And then they grow up and it come, becomes a lot more difficult and you're trying to think of all the arguments and angles to try to get your kid to do the right thing and do, be a Christian and all these other things and not date that person over there. And, you know, what? there's so many deeds that it, it's laughable to say you're a parent without deeds. If you're a parent without deeds, you ain't a parent anymore. If you're a Christian without deeds, the same applies. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you do it because you love them. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. You're forming your, this child. You know, imagine we get a little more spiritual. He was shepherding without deeds. You know, helping your fellow Christians without actions and phone calls and prayers and times and fun times and coffee times and buy all kinds of things and tears and searching and late nights and all the things that go into shepherding without deeds. If you're a shepherd without deeds, then you're not a shepherd. I think I've read that a few times. And the whole point was that they would wake up. And if they already were doing it, they would feel great. Like, okay, good. I'm going to get more workers now. <laughs> good. We're all going to do it together. It's not just going to be a few of us. We're all going to get on this. Let's keep going. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith? I already read that. Okay. 
just take a picture of this, because I, I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> okay, there's, that can be your quiet time. But your saving faith, to have a saving faith has got to involve Christ. If you're doing what you're doing without Christ, then it's not a saving faith. If whatever you're doing, if it's not because of Christ or in the name of Christ or in response to Christ, then you're just wasting your time. And, and with the cross and the empty tomb guiding you and leading you and inspiring you, that it, it agrees with God's word. You can put everything into practice, but if it doesn't agree with God's word, then again, it doesn't do anything. It's got to agree with the flawless and eternal word of God. Great saving faith produces and leads to repentance and good works. When you have a faith from God, it just automatically leads towards God and toward being like him and, and putting that into our lives. It overcomes doubts, not that it doesn't have doubts, not that it doesn't have questions, and not that it doesn't have things that don't make sense, and not that you're not upset at God sometimes, but you work it out. Help me overcome my unbelief that our words and our actions go together. What we say and what we do, we're not perfect. That, if you want perfection, then you can just leave right now because none of us are that. <laughs> but your words and your deeds go together. When your kids look at you, they go, yeah, you're a Christian. Amen. When your teenage kids are honest when they look at you, they say you're a Christian. <laughs> if your kids say that you're not, then you might want to look into that. Because that, that, they might be telling you something that you need to hear. I'm serious. You might still be a Christian, but you might still need to hear what they have to say because they're probably right. And a saving faith involves a relationship with Christ. And when you read, you know, you notice all those are in the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. There's, there's a parallel there. But the, his main concern in the Sermon on the Mount wasn't all the things that they were doing. He says, you never knew me. When you have a relationship with Christ, your faith comes out of that and you're led closer to him. I guess I did have time for that. <laughs> he continues on and he talks about Abraham and we're going to read that in just a second here. And on Wednesday night, we did a whole class for the men on Abraham. So you can look at that. But it was just pretty cool. I was out hiking the other day and I ran across this, I told the guys this, but this bighorn sheep was like 12 yards away from me. And I just kind of came around a corner and looked up, and he's like, right where James is. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. It took me a while to get my camera out to be able to take a picture. But it just made me think of that story about Abraham. And here the, the ram was like eating the leaves on the tree, and you could see how maybe he could get stuck. I got Steve's attention there. He's really looking here. <laughs> I thought about you, bro, when I was up there. Uh, but it talks about faith and deeds. Imagine the faith in the, that Abraham had in that. And he, it took him three days to get to a place that was only half a day away because he needed to work out his faith with God. When you read Hebrews 11, it says that he finally worked it out. And when you read how he did it, you think, man, this guy really thought about this. This wasn't easy. It wasn't just like snap your fingers and you have faith. I mean, he really had to choose to trust God in a situation that was well beyond what he could understand. He had to remember what God had already done in his life, and eventually he had to learn to let go and let God take care of it. That's where God is leading us, that he doesn't want us to blindly accept, but he wants us to put our faith into practice, even to the point where Abraham went. And then Rahab is something I want to encourage you guys to read for this week in jo uh, Joshua chapter 2. And just think about what was her faith and what did she do? What was her faith and what did she do? You could do the same thing with Abraham in Genesis 22. And if you don't have a plan for your family group, that would be a good family group. Read Joshua 2 and talk about, let me talk about what was her faith and what was her deeds and how did that come together and why was she held up in the book of James? Which you think about, that was pretty amazing. 
to hold up a Gentile to these churches. Oh, man, that was a tough one. Not only that, but to mention Abraham and then the next person to mention Rahab and go, oh, my goodness, but holding up that she had an incredible and awesome faith that's an example for all of us, even today, and that her deeds were working together. And so I pray that today you think about that scripture, that faith without deeds is dead, but God wants you to have a saving faith. And we're going to take our communion together. And I, when I think about Jesus and his faith and his actions are perfect. The message to the disciples in Asia Minor was to persevere, to focus on Christ, and to remember why you're doing what you're doing. Remember his love for you. Remember his joy that he was, it was you. And in Hebrews 12, it says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That was the message for the Christians in Asia. Run with perseverance. Don't give up. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I pray that today that we're fixing our eyes on Christ. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. His faith and his deeds allowed him to endure incredible suffering. His deeds were the things that he did when he was going on the cross, but also the things that he didn't do. He didn't retaliate. He didn't call down angels. He, he didn't say anything. He wasn't sarcastic. He allowed this to take place. And it says that he was able to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word that just tells us like it is, Father, that keeps it straight and simple. And yet, God, I know that walking with you is, is the joy of all of our... It's the destiny for each one of us, God. I thank you for Jesus that helped us to uh, find the path. And God, thank you that you're reaching out to each one of us even today. God, I pray that you... Uh, we think about the ways that you've spoken to us, that we d decide, make decisions to make you the Lord of our life and, or to even find out what that means. God, thank you for Jesus who gave up his body for us, his body and blood, that we could have true forgiveness. We love you. We pray in his name. Amen.